All right, we are uh, recording. So tonight's class is titled, What's in a Name? What's in a Name? Now, there's actually a uh, very interesting story, which uh, may be of interest to, uh, to everybody, which I'm going to tell. It's a story that happened many, many, uh, many, many years ago. Um, it is actually a story about a famous sage whose name was the Ramban, Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman. He lived in the um, 1300s and um, late 1200s, early 1300s. <clears throat> and there's a story really about him and about, about one of his students. And then you'll understand why I'm telling you the story shortly. So, um, the, um, the Ramban had a student whose name was Avner, Avner, A-V-N-E-R, or in Hebrew, Alev Bet Nun Reish. You'll see why that's important soon. Uh, the student uh, lived from, he was born in 1270, and he passed away uh, possibly 1348, but we don't know exactly. In any event, <clears throat> this, uh, this man was a student of uh, Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman. Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman was a great Kabbalist, one of the early Kabbalists, and um, there are various opinions that it was he that preserved, he, he was the one that kept the, um, uh, the, the Zohar, the, the uh, teachings of the Zohar, the writings of the Zohar, the manuscript, he had in his possession, and he sent it to, or he sent a copy to <coughs> Moshe the Leon, the person who actually published the Zohar. Um, that's speculation, whether it came from him or not, but uh, that is one of the, um, uh, that is one of the uh, theories, that he had the original manuscript, which was written uh, by Rabbi Shimon and by Yochai. So you can imagine, in any event, that he was a very, very uh, accomplished Kabbalist and a great sage and scholar at the same time. Now, this uh, Rabbi, Rabbi uh, Moshe ben Nachman would teach the Ramban, we call him. He would, uh, he would teach on a regular basis. And in one of his classes, uh, he taught his students that everything is hinted to in the Torah and has its source over there. Why is that? Because it says, uh, it, says in the, it says in the Zohar that God looked into the Torah and he created the world. Istakul baraisa ubara alma. Well, the more um, Swadic version is Istakel baraita ubara alma. He created uh, the world. He looked into the Torah, created the world. Now, since the world was not a one time creation, it's an ongoing thing. So we would understand that the ongoing nature of creation means that every time an event happens, every time there's some, uh, um, uh, there's some change, something is born, something changes, something, whatever it is, that's God looking into the Torah and creating the world. What is the Torah? The Torah is the way the, um, uh, the Zohar says it, and it's also brought down in uh, several Midrashic uh, tomes, Midrashic literature. It's a rabbinic literature that uh, discusses um, uh, scripture. So it, it's explained there that um, the Torah is called sort of the blueprint, the blueprint and the workbook of creation. Difteraot or pinkasaot you law. It's the blueprint and the ledger in which all the quantities, etc., etc., are written down, and that's what the Torah is. A Torah is now. That's only, in fact, one aspect of the Torah. The aspects of the Torah through which the world is created is the outermost dimension of the Torah. It's not the innermost dimension of the Torah. The innermost dimension of the Torah talks about things which are way beyond the uh, physical creation. The inner dimension of the Torah, particularly as is brought out in Kabbalah and Hasidic teachings, that inner dimension of the Torah uh, talks much more about souls then it talks about space and time. 
it's all about it's about divine energy. A soul is also divine energy. In any event, the Ramban was teaching this uh, concept, and he mentioned that everything is hinted to in the Torah, and in particular, in there's a one there's one of this uh, a song of the Torah. There are ten songs in the Torah altogether, actually nine, and the tenth one will be taught in the future. But there are nine songs written in the Torah. There's the song of Dvora, there's a song by the sea, there's, uh, uh, there's, and, and there's the song at the, end, at the end, towards the end of the Torah called Ha'azinu. The song called Ha'azinu is in chapter 32 of Deuteronomy. Chapter 32. So in the CEC, he said in particular, uh, said the Ramban, that everything is hinted at, the entire future is hinted at in this song called Ha'azinu, chapter 32 of Deuteronomy, everything is hinted there. Shortly after he gave this lecture, uh, this student of his named Avner disappeared. Not to be seen, um, not to be seen for many, many years. There were rumors that he had gone to, he had become an apostate, and in fact that was true, and he changed his name. He was born in a city called Castilla, Castile, somewhere in Spain, I believe. But he changed his name to Alfonso <laughs> of Valladolid. Alfonso de Valladolid, that's what he, um, his name was originally Avner Mibugus, and he changed his name to Alfonso Validolid, anyway, whatever. So he changed his name and he and he disappeared. He became an apostate, and he didn't just become an apostate, but he became somebody who um, was very much involved in the academia of that time, and um, he became a philosopher. And one of his uh, he wrote he wrote several books. One of the books that he wrote was actually about the his try to prove that man has absolutely no free choice. He has no free choice. He's a product of um, other forces, forces that are beyond his, uh, beyond his capacity to, um, to control or perhaps even to understand. And um, so he became what would be called in philosophical jargon, he became really a, a determinist. Determinism was his, um, uh, which is completely anathema to the Jewish way of thinking, is that everybody has free choice. You have free choice. Otherwise, there would be no concept of reward and punishment. There would be no concept of, uh, of, of responsibility for things. If, you don't, if it's not your choice, if you didn't choose to do it, but if you're just simply forced to do uh, by... by some kind of hidden hand, uh, then there should be no repercussions um, in terms of uh, in terms of law, in terms of punishments, in terms of whatever. There shouldn't be any repercussions. So he was the, he um, he believed it very much in this philosophy, and he preached it, and he taught it, and he wrote books about it, and so on and so forth. Now, one day, soldiers come to the synagogue of the Ramban. The Ramban um, was, uh, he was a very famous rabbi, and um, he, he was in the synagogue on the holiest day of the Jewish calendar, which is called Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And he was in the synagogue, and soldiers came into the synagogue, and they grabbed him, and they said, um, we are taking you in front of um, our leader or um, whatever, he had some kind of official position, and uh, we're taking in front of Alfonso. And they brought the Ramban in, in front of Alfonso, and Alfonso said to the Ramban, do you remember me? So I said, no. <laughs> he obviously looked a lot different. You know, I don't remember who, who are you. So I told him, I was Avner. I was once your student. You remember? Yes, yes, I remember. And said, what happened to you? So he, um, 
he said that you once taught us that well, there was a, I, I don't want to make the story too long to tell all the details of what happened, but um, he said you once taught us that everything is hinted to in the Torah, and uh, particularly in the section of Ha'azinu, this uh, song of the Torah in chapter 32 of Deuteronomy. And I could not accept that. And uh, after thinking about that for a while, I decided that uh, it's all baloney and I'm out of here. And he left. And I went and I studied sciences and I went and um, studied logic and so on and so forth. And I've written books and uh, I'm now a famous man. And the Ramban said to him, and I still maintain that that is true. What I said then, that everything is hinted to in Ha'azinu, is true. So Avner, who is now called um, Al Alfonso, challenged him. He said, so where is my name in the Torah? So he said, your name in the Torah is in the following verse. And I'm going to put the verse on the screen. There we go. Your name in the Torah, as you see, Deuteronomy uh, 32, 27. Uh, your, your name is here in this verse. As you see, Hazin Ulam Bet Chapzain. Amrati Afahem Ashbisa Menosh Zichram. Deuteronomy 32, 27. I said, I will scatter them. I will cause their memory to be lost from man. It's a klala, it's a curse, and um, it has a very, uh, very deep meaning, but let's not get into that now. When, uh, when he quoted him this verse, so Avner said, I don't see my name in there. So he said, take every third letter of these words, and if you take every third letter, there it is, it's highlighted here, bolded rather. If you take every third letter, it spells... It spells the word Avner. If you know how to write Avner in Hebrew, that's how you would write it, right? Aleph, Bet, Nun, Resh. Yes, Avner. That would be it. However, there's an, in addition, there's an R, there's a Resh in front of it. This Resh in front of it stands for, if you just call someone, uh, if, if when, when, when you write uh, a person's name in Hebrew and you want to give him sort of a, an honorific title, you want to honor him, you call him Reb, Reb or Rav. Reb means someone who's, uh, it's, it's just a, it's, a, um, it's uh, a, a, a term of respect and honor. So I told him, the stands for, he has your name, Reb Avner. So Avner sat and he thought for a while, and he said, So what is my what is my tikkun? What is my rectification? How can I rectify what I've messed up? So the Ramban said to him, read the verse. The verse tells you what you have to do. And the verse says, I said I will scatter them or cause their memory to be lost from man. That's what you have to do. And the Ramban walked, uh, turned on his heel and he walked out. So it said that this Rav Avner then left all his possessions behind, took one boat and enough food for uh, several weeks, got on the boat without any other um, uh, assistance, and he set sail and was never heard from again. I will cause their memory to be lost from man. But the interesting thing is, the, the, the Kabbalists who explain this say that this, the Reish in front of his name which is a title of honor, shows that he had the capacity, and not only the capacity, but the actuality. And in fact, he was able to rectify what he did wrong. He was able to read because he returned to a position of honor and respect. That's what it says in the verse. So, we see from here that a person's name and in fact, every person's name is hinted to either in Ha'azinu or in the rest of the Torah. So when we talk about what's in a name, um, 
when we talk about what's in a name, what we're really saying, therefore, is where is my name in the Torah? Now, there's methods for finding this out, um, and uh, it can be done, but it's an interesting, it's a very interesting thing uh, to find the verse or verses where a person's name appears. Now, obviously, um, the best way to do this, or the, 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 the easiest way, is when a person has a Hebrew name, because then it's easier to find it. But if, even if a person doesn't have a Hebrew name for whatever reason, the, uh, the English name or whatever the name that he has, can, he or she, can be written in Hebrew letters and then found in various verses, consecutive letters, there's the third letter, the first letters, and so on and so forth, or the second letters, the last letters. And it can be found sometimes in a number of different, a number of different verses. And reading those verses, understanding those verses is actually very edifying. Um, sometimes it's mystifying, but very often it's very edifying, and it gives a person a, a real direction. Now, why is this? Like, why, why is it that knowing the origin of your name in the Torah is so, can be so edifying and uplifting and instructive and uh, give a person direction and purpose right throughout his or her life? Because of what we already said, God looked into the Torah and he created the world. He looked into the, into, into the Torah and he created souls. Even though souls aren't, technically speaking, created, at least the higher levels of souls are not created. Let's just, uh, cl let me just clarify that point. There are actually five levels of soul or five levels of consciousness that are spoken about in Kabbalah. The first consciousness is physical consciousness, the consciousness of the body, and that's called nefesh. That aspect of soul is called nefesh. Um, I will write it in the chat over here so that you can see, and I'll do them uh, one after the other. So the first level is called nefesh. Nefesh is again the life of the um, the physical body. It's the consciousness and the and the life force, the energy of the physical body. That's called nefesh. The next level is called ruach. Ruach is the life force, the energy of a person's emotions. It's emotional energy. And it's the structure of the emotions. And the consciousness of emotions. The next level is called Neshama. All of these are generic names to a certain extent because they, they, they are sometimes uh, interchangeable. People aren't careful about how we use them. But the next one is called Neshama, and that is the... Consciousness of intellect. It's um, I don't want to call it theoretical consciousness because it doesn't it doesn't quite describe it. Theoretical could mean the wrong thing, but it's conscious of the intellect. Intellectual processes are what the neshama. It's the consciousness of ideas, of ideas and logic. That's neshama. Then there's the next level is called chaya, which is a transcendent aspect. It's really the consciousness of will. And then Yechida, Yechida is the consciousness of oneness, of unity. It's uni unity consciousness, consciousness of unity with God, unity with all of creation, unity with everything. That's called Yechida. That's a tra also a transcendent. These two are transcendent powers of the soul. Chaya and Yechida. Okay, so uh, if anyone wants them in Hebrew, I'll just quickly do them in Hebrew. Um, nefesh, ruach, neshama, chaya, yechida. Okay, there you go. From bottom to top. Nefesh, ruach, neshama, chaya, yechida. Okay, so. The outer dimension of the name of a person's name, that which interfaces with the physical creation is really primarily the nefesh aspect. 
which has inner dimensions of the name, particularly from the level of the Shama and upwards. And therefore, um, it can be very, very instructive to understand one's name when it appears in a certain verse, not at, uh, at, at, at sometimes certain names appear in, uh, in verses as they are. In other words, my name, for example, Moshe, Moshe, appears in many, many verses. The whole Torah is said to, Mo, to Moshe and Moses, right? Uh, so um, his name appears very often, but it often appears also in consecutive letters in a verse, either the first letters or the second letters or the last letters or the third letters, whatever it happens to be, and that can be very, very instructive to understand. And that if it's, let's say, only one verse, that one verse might be talking about uh, from five different points of view. There are five different analyses of the same verse, each one corresponding to a level of consciousness, from nefesh consciousness all the way to yechida consciousness. Now, obviously, this is an analysis. This is not something that, um, you know, you can do standing on one foot. It has to be thought about. It has to be analyzed. It has to be uh, checked into, uh, cross-referenced, and so on and so forth. It, it, it's, it's a lot of work to figure this out. But it's, it is, in my opinion, a worthwhile, um, uh, worthwhile effort. Now, once a person understands what their name is all about in terms of how it appears in the Torah, then one can select um, a, an end point, a goal. Not just a goal, but really um, a goal could be an intermediary thing, but select an entire purpose for the person's life and uh, start to work towards it. So when we say that a name is something of great importance, it is terribly important. The Talmud tells a story about uh, Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Meir was a very, um, uh, was a very, very insightful person. He had, he had also, he, this was in Talmudic times. And the time of the Mishnah, Rabbi Meir is the Stam, uh, Stam Mishnah Rabbi Meir. So um, Rabbi Meir was a very, very great sage, and he would, he would darshan shemot, which means he would learn names. In other words, when a person, when he saw a person, he find out that person's name, uh, uh, someone asked a question here, the inner dimension of the name is connected to a higher level of the soul. The inner dimension of the name is connected to one of the higher levels of soul. Okay, so this Rabbi Meir, um, when, he, when he met a person and he knew their name, he would connect their name to when he knew about the significance of that name in terms of the verses, in terms of the verses of the Torah, and sometimes he would act accordingly. So one of the stories that's told is that once went to, he was with a number of other sages, and they were traveling, and he went to an inn. And uh, they all went to an inn, and they were going to stay there the night. And then the, the owner of the inn, the uh, person who was sort of serving them, the owner of the inn, Rabbi Meir asked him his name. So he gave what, whatever the name was, and uh, Rabbi Meir said to his friends, I'm out of here, see you guys. Um, <laughs> I'm going to stay somewhere else. So they kind of laughed at him, and they said, you know, may I come on, you know, just... Uh, <laughs> Chill, <laughs> you know, chill a bit. And uh, but he 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 was uh, he was adamant that he wasn't staying there the night. And in fact, he didn't. Well, they met again the next morning, and as they were on their way, um, every one of the other sages realized that he'd been robbed in the night. <laughs> and. Um, they went back to the inn and they accosted this um, the innkeeper and they discovered that, in fact, it was him. Um, they found out how, how he could have stolen the... Um, uh, they figured it all out. And um, Anyway, he got his... I suppose he got his just desserts or whatever. He was in prison. Whatever happened to him doesn't matter. It's not, it's not the issue now. 
But you see that some of the sages uh, were very careful about understanding people's names and the context of people's names and how they located those names in various verses or whatever, how they located those names in terms of their meaning or in terms of their letters and so on and so forth. Now, obviously, the longer a person's name is, the more letters that a person's name is, the more, yeah, name ha um, uh, the, the more letters a person's name has, the more complicated it is to find exactly the, um, um, the verses. But nevertheless, even a five, six uh, letter name is um, not that difficult to, uh, to figure out. Um, I mean, it takes time, and then understanding how it applies to the various aspects of a person's life, that is another whole art. It's, a, it's an art, um, I suppose the science too to a certain extent, but it's certainly um, something that, that one has to um, spend a lot of time thinking about. And uh, that's the importance of a name. Uh, now, someone asked over here, Andrea asked, do we use a first and middle Hebrew name? Um, the first name is the more important one. The middle name is secondary. And if person has three names, the third one is obviously tertiary. Uh, so the, the most important one is the, uh, the first name. Now you may find, as is reasonably common, that the name could be spelt out in order or out of order in certain verses. A person might find that his name is spelled only in order. The name where it is in order is the most important one. The places where the name is, where the letters are out of order, uh, that has to be looked into as something that may require tikkun. and may require some kind of uh, rectification or some kind of um, special... Um, work to be done to, so to speak, set the name right, that the letter should be in the right order, in the order of the name. Uh, that's not necessarily so, but that is something to think, uh, that is something to think about. Um, where the letters are completely reversed, let's say, uh, for instance, um, in the name, if my name would be, well, my name is Moshe, Right, if you then get the letters exactly the opposite way, way round, the opposite way round, that mem at the end over there, that letter at the end, is the same as this one over here, except that when it comes at an end of a word, it has a slightly different form. The five letters in the Hebrew alphabet, they go like that. In any event, um, when if the letters are reversed, then one has to look into that as well as a... Um, sort of a reversal pattern, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a mirror image of, of something else. And uh, that has to be, uh, that anyone, one has to try and understand that as well. Now, not in every case is it possible to understand it right away now in terms of uh, what's happening in my life, but it could be as a sort of a future prediction, it could be an indication of something that happened in the past. And uh, it is a uh, very, um, in, uh, insight giving, I don't know if that's the right word, um, it gives a lot of insight into, uh, into one's life. That's my experience. Okay, are there any questions? Gloria Esther. Yeah, there's a verse with Gloria in it. <laughs> Do I do it for people? Um, I can do it for people. Um, it does take time, so I do, you know, I'm, I'm not non-commercial here, but I, I would have to charge for the time. But if, you, if you're interested, just, you know, it's better to contact me privately. Um, yeah, right. Uh, you can contact me privately and uh, I can try and figure something out for you. It'll usually take a few days because... Um, um, there's not only finding the name, there's then trying to figure out like how this applies and you know what the different dimensions of it are. And if there's more than one verse, then you know try and figure them all out and put them in, in the proper perspective and so on. So anyway, what if you don't use your birth name? Um, if you don't use your birth name, that's an interesting question. 
your birth name is still the name that you were given at your birth, and that's your gateway, so to speak. Uh, when I say gateway, let me explain what I mean. Um, the Sefer Yetzirah, the famous Sefer Yetzirah, the book that was um, said to have been written by Abraham. Um, that book, Sefer Yetzirah, has a Mishnah. In fact, I have it here, just one second, and I will show you. No, um, that's not it. That's one second. I'm looking here. Um, Sorry, I'm just um, looking in various places here, and I don't see. No, it should be here. All right, never mind. Um, there is a Mishnah. All right, I, I thought I had it written here, but it doesn't matter. But uh, all right, it doesn't matter. Let me just tell it to you. Um, you have a great thing to, uh, to do as part of life scripting, yeah? I could certainly do that, yes. Um, okay, so it says in the Sefer Yetzirah, it's talking about the letters, the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and it says that two letters build two houses. Two letters build two houses. Um, okay, okay, yeah, fine, that's, uh, that's doable. Two letters build two houses. Let me explain what I mean here. Uh, if you have two letters in Hebrew, right, if you have two letters in Hebrew, Aleph and Bet, so they form two houses. What does it mean, two houses? You can have, this is called one house, one house where the earlier letter in the alphabet comes first and the second letter in the alphabet comes second. And then you have uh, the other way around, where you have the second letter first. So it built, two letters build two houses. Three letters build six houses. In other words, there's six possible permutations. Houses means permutations. Six possible permutations. If you have four letters, it's, um, uh, what would it be, uh, 12 permutations, I think, right? Is that correct? Well, the mathematicians amongst us, please help. I think it's 12 permutations, but then it goes on from there and it can, be, become, it can become um, very, very complex. But the Sefer Yetzira says that these two letters, any two letters together are called the Sha'ar. They're called the person's Sha'ar, the person's gate. The letters of his name are called the gateway by which he goes in and by which he comes out. When I say he, I don't mean he necessarily, he or she the gateway by which a person goes in or out. So therefore, the gateway is, is extremely important. So the name that the person was given at birth is the initial gateway. A later name is an additional gateway and could be, it could be that it becomes the primary gateway. It depends. Uh, one has to look into uh, both names and see which, uh, which is in fact more... Um, um, more powerful or more influential in the person's life. Um, but the first one never really goes away. Never really goes away. Now, what if a person has three different names or whatever? There's three names. Well, as I said before, the first name is the most important, then the second and third. Um, but a name that a person never uses, it sort of starts to fade. Even though it's still a gate, uh, it does start to fade nevertheless. And... Um, And so um, it could be that other names become uh, consequently more important, but this would depend on the individual. One would have to uh, one would have to see one would have to see how this pans out. Each person is going to be different. Any more questions?